All right, section 4.8. We're going to do word problems. Yay. Cue the applause sign. I know you guys are excited. I'm excited too. So how do we solve polynomial uh, problems using polynomial equations? So today you're going to have five examples on your sheet. I am also pulling example two from page 199 of the textbook because it highlights the physics type problems that are in the homework. So here we go. Now this is something we've gone over before, so if you want to skim through this part, go right ahead. Remember, before you write anything down, read the entire problem and figure out what the problem is asking for. Make sure you highlight or underline whatever the problem is asking you to tell them. Secondly, choose a variable and use it with the given facts to represent the numbers described in the problem. So it, it's good to get in the habit of saying let x equal this or y equal this or whatever. You don't have to do it, but it just makes things easier because it kind of sets the parameters for you to solve the problems. Reread the problem and write an equation that represents the relationships. Draw diagrams and pictures and charts if it helps you. And solve the equation, find out what's required, and don't forget to check your results and write down the units. If you don't write down the units, you're going to lose points. So, a mathematical model. An equation that represents a real-life problem is called a mathematical model. And that's something that you're going to be doing a lot if you use engineering or chemistry or physics. A lot of things have mathematical models. So, in real life, getting the right answer is not enough because sometimes you don't know what the right answer is. If you're running an experiment, you can't just look in the back of the book. So you need to justify what you're doing and explain to the reader how you reach your conclusion because when they look over your work, they're going to judge it, and if they don't like your methods and how you solved it, they're going to consider your results invalid. So you need to show your work and get used to that process. All right, example one. Two numbers differ by 5 and have a product of 84. Find the numbers. So let's start by labeling our variables. We'll call x the larger number and x minus 5 the smaller number. So if the product is 84, we just have to multiply them together. So x times x minus 5 is 84. Now, you could have said, well, I'm going to call x the smaller number and x plus 5 the larger number. Either way, you're going to get the same answer. So now we just basically multiply the x times the x minus 5, move the 84 from the right to the left side, so you have a quadratic equation, x squared minus 5x minus 84. So again, you're looking for two factors of 84, negative 84 that add up to negative 5. You get negative 12 and 7. So x minus 12 times x plus 7 equals 0. So x minus 12 equals 0, or x plus 7 equals 0. Now, I've gotten to the point where if you don't want to write this step, you can just go ahead and jump to x equals 12 or x equals negative 7. I'm fine with that. The reason I wanted you to put this step before is because I want you to indicate the zero product property where you have to show that either factor must equal 0 for the statement to be true. All right, so these are our two x's, 12 and negative 7. Since I use x minus 5 as the smaller number and x as the larger number, if x is 12, then x minus 5 is 7. If x is negative 7, then x minus 5 is negative 12. So our numbers are either 7 and 12 or negative 7 and negative 12. And if you use x plus 5 for the larger and x for the smaller, you would have gotten the same answer. Example 2, the sum of two numbers is 9, the sum of their squares is 101, find the numbers. Alright, so this is simple enough. Let's call x one number, and let's let 9 minus x be the other number, since the other number plus x is 9. So, back in chapter 3 we did a substitution, I'm skipping the substitution step. So you might have said x is the first number, y is the second number, x plus y equals 9, and you would have gotten y equals 9 minus x. So, I'm just skipping through that. Just know that x plus 9 minus x equals 9. And if you add them together, you see the x's cancel out. All right, so we know that the sum is 9. The sum of their squares is 101. So the square of x is x squared. The square of 9 minus x is 9 minus x squared. So now you just put those together. x squared plus 9 minus x quantity squared equals 101. So remember, when you do these word problems, don't try to do it all at once. Break them down step by step, and it's really not that bad. All right, so now we just expand and solve. So you expand the 9 minus x squared to get this. 
you combine everything together, I move the 101 to the left side, and you get 2x squared minus 18x minus 20 equals 0. You can divide the whole thing by 2, so you get x squared minus x minus 10 equals 0. Look again, you're going to look for two factors that add up to, to multiply up to negative 10, that add up to negative 9, which happens to be x minus 10 times x, minus 1, x plus 1. So x is either 10 or negative 1. Now we need to figure out what the other number is. So, since the other number is 9 minus x, if x is 10, the other number is negative 1. If x is negative 1, then the other number is 10. So we're basically getting the same answer twice. So the final solution, the two numbers are negative 1 and 10. So sometimes this will happen. You get two answers, and when you substitute to try to get the other one, you're going to get the one you solved already. So in this case, there's only one solution, whereas in example 1, there were two. Example 3. The length of a rectangle is 1 meter less than twice the width. If the area is 55 square meters, find the perimeter. Alright, so this is about the point where I would encourage you to try to solve some of these problems on your own and then check to see if the answer you received or you got is correct by pausing the video and restarting when you're ready. So, let's start by figuring out the relationship. Let's call the length L and the width W in meters. Now, we know that if the length is one less than twice the width, let's start with the twice the width part. Twice the width, that's going to be two times w. One less than twice the width is going to be two w minus one. So, length is two w minus one. Twice the width, two w, one less, minus one. So L equals two w minus one. Now you know that the area equals the length times the width. So I'm going to substitute 55 for A, and this expression 2w minus 1 for w and we put that all together you get 55 equals 2w minus 1 times w and that's going to be the equation you're going to solve for w so let's expand 55 equals 2w squared minus w and let's move the 55 over to the right side and then I just switched it over so you're gonna get 2w squared minus w minus 55 equals 0 now, this is about the place where you would use the box method. I basically am not recreating the box on the slide. If you use the box method, the factors you're going to get are negative 11 and 10 because they add up to negative 1. So all I did here, and if you do this, that's fine. That's, you don't, that's fine too. I basically separated the negative w into plus 10 minus 11. And that's another way you can do it instead of the box method. You, once you figure out the factors, you can just write them into your equation. And now what I'm going to do is factor the 2w out of the first two terms and the negative 11 out of the second two terms. So you get 2w times w plus 5 minus 11 times w plus 5. So again, if you don't want to do this step, you want to do the box, you want to do the railroad, you want to do the cross, you have another method that works, use that. I'm only doing it here because it's safe space. So you end up getting 2w minus 11 times w plus 5 equals 0. So w is going to equal either 11 halves or negative 5. Now, you can't have a negative 5 width. Width has to be positive. So the width, in this case, has to be 11 halves meters. So now you've figured out the width, you need to go back and solve for the length. The length is 2w minus 1. So you plug in the 11 halves for w, 2 times 11 halves minus 1, and you get that the length is 10 meters. So the question asks for the perimeter. Remember, find out what the question is asking for. So the perimeter of a rectangle is 2 times the width plus 2 times the length. Plug in 11 halves for W, plug in 10 for L, and you get the perimeter is 31 meters. Example 4. The sum of the squares of two consecutive even numbers is 100. Find the numbers. All right. So let's call N the first even number. Let's call the next even number N plus 2. So... If you haven't gotten this far, you can go ahead and attempt this one yourself. All right, so we know that the square of n is n squared. The square of n plus 2 is n plus 2 quantity squared. And we are looking to see that the sum of those squares is 100. So you just add them together. n squared plus n plus 2 quantity squared equals 100. And you're going to solve for n. So n squared and then I expanded the n plus 2 quantity squared, n squared plus n squared plus 4n plus 4 minus 100, I moved the 100 over here, equals 0. 
Combine all those terms, you get 2n squared plus 4n minus 96 equals 0. I don't like the 2 in the front. And since everything's even, I'm going to divide it out. n squared plus 2n minus 48 equals 0. And again, you just factor. n plus 8 times n minus 6. So n is either negative 8 or 6. All right, now we got to figure out the next number. If n is negative 8, then the next even number is negative 6. If n is 6, then the next even number is 8. So we have two pairs of solutions. The numbers are either 6 and 8 or negative 8 and negative 6. All right, example 5. The product of three consecutive integers is 21 more than the cube of the smallest integer. Find the integers. All right, so the first thing you want to do, well, you want to attempt this yourself because I think you have enough knowledge and ability to do this. So try this one yourself. All right, the first thing you have to do is label what each variable is. So let's call n the first integer. The next two integers are n plus 1 and n plus 2. hope that makes sense. So if you call n the first integer, the next consecutive integer is one more than the first. And the next one after that is one more than the second, or two more than the first. So Now, the product of all three of these is 21 more than the cube of the smallest. So let's do the product of these three. You just multiply all three things together. So the product of three consecutive integers, n times n plus 1 times n plus 2. The cube of the smallest integer, which is the second part here, is the n cubed. So we know there's some sort of relationship between the product of three consecutive integers and the cube of the smallest integer. And it says that the product of these three is 21 more than this. So we subtract a 21 from this side to make it even. Or you could have put a 21 plus 21 over here. If this is 21 more than the n cubed, you need to subtract a 21 here to make this equation true. All right, so at this point, all you do is expand everything and solve for n. Now, you see an n cubed? Don't worry about it, because it's going to go bye-bye. Let's expand. So n plus 1 times n plus 2 becomes n squared plus 3n plus 2. Now we distribute the n. And you get n cubed plus 3n squared plus 2n minus 21 minus n cubed equals 0. I moved this n cubed to the left side so we can get a 0 on the right. Well, the n cubes cancel each other out, and so you're just left with a quadratic equation. 3n squared plus 2n minus 21. And again, this is where you would use the box or the cross or whatever. So I'm looking for factors of negative 63, 3 times negative 21 that add up to 2 which are 9 and negative 7. So again, I'm doing it this way. Do whatever you want to figure out the factors. And you see that your factors are going to be 3n minus 7 times n plus 3. So n is going to equal either 7 thirds or negative 3. Now, we need n to be an integer because it says it's an integer. So the 7 thirds solution is unacceptable. So we have to take n is negative 3. So if n is negative 3, the next two integers are negative 2 and negative 1. So the three integers are negative 3, negative 2, and negative 1. All right, the last thing I want to cover is this concept of vertical motion. Since most of you haven't taken Phoenix, one particular mathematical model deals with vertical motion. If you launch a projectile vertically upward with an initial speed of v, the height h above the launch point t seconds later is given by those two formulas. The first one is if you're working with the meters unit, and the second is if you're working in feet. You don't have to memorize those. If they show up on a test, I will give you the formulas. Now, when the height is 0, that means the time is either 0 or the t is the total time it took for the projectile to come back to Earth. So if you think about it, take a, I don't know, Take, say you're shooting a tennis ball in the air with a tennis ball launcher or whatever. When you start at t equals 0, the h is equal 0, whatever the level of your launcher is. It's going to go straight up in the air. It's going to get slower until it gets to the top halfway through its path. And then it's going to come back down. It's going to take the same amount of time to go up as it did to come down if you're working in an environment where there's no air resistance. All right, so 
when the height is zero, either you just started or it's the total time it took for it to come back to Earth. So let's take a look at example two on page 199. A batter hits a baseball straight up with the speed of 96 feet per second. Question is, how long is the ball in the air before being caught by the catcher? And B, how high does the ball go? Let's tackle the first one first. We use the formula for feet. So the height is equal to the velocity times the time minus 16 t squared. Now the 16, this account, accounts for gravity. So the reason the ball doesn't go and keep going is because gravity is pulling the ball back towards the earth. So this is basically including the acceleration that gravity has on the ball. You don't need to know that until you take physics. For now, all we need is plug in numbers. So we want the height. The height is going to be zero because when it's caught at the catcher, and again, you kind of have to understand this, the batter is hitting the ball at the same level that the catcher's catching. Just take my word for it. So we plug in. H is zero. We know that V is 96. So we plug that in, and you get the equation 0 equals 96t minus 16t squared. So you factor out the t after you divide both sides by 6. I'm going to move everything to the left side. So t squared minus 6t equals 0, factor out a t, and you get that t equals 0 or t equals 6. The t equals 0 makes sense because that's when the ball could have been caught. It's at the same level it started. Six seconds makes sense because it's how long it took for it to go all the way up and all the way down. So the ball was in the air for a total of six seconds. Now when you take physics, you're not going to ever get these nice round numbers. You can get other questions like how high is the ball, how, how long does it take for the ball to reach 20 feet above the ground. But for the purpose of this class, this is all you need to know. All right, part B. How high does the ball go? If you use a formula for feet, we know that the ball reaches its maximum height halfway between 0 and 6 seconds. So halfway between 0 and 6 is 3. Now think about it. If you throw something straight up, it's going to take about the same amount of time for it to go up as it does to come down. Now in a vacuum, it takes the exact same amount of time. So we plug in t for equals 3 and solve for h. So h is 96 times 3 minus 16, 3 squared. H is 144. So the maximum height of the ball above the level of the bat is 144 feet. All right, so for the next couple of days, we're going to be working on word problems. You'll do a handful tomorrow, and you'll do a handful on the day after that. We're going to get to the point where hopefully you feel somewhat comfortable doing these word problems, and it incorporates everything we've learned in terms of solving these quadratic equations. All right, that's it for section 4.8. If you have any questions, write them down. and contact me and tell me about what I need to explain better tomorrow.